Before we jump into the reading of the scripture, um, that Talon's going to come, and if you're looking in your Bible, we're going to change the passage. It's going to be just verses 38 through 40 and verse 50. But I want to address this message of hopefully encouragement to our youth and let the rest of you be overhears of that. So to get into this passage, it's good to know the context of a text. Sometimes we just jump into a text and we don't know what's going on. Well, you probably remember, but just to refresh our memory together, David was the youngest of all of his brothers. I can relate because I was the youngest in my family. I had two older sisters. And in my Bible, it actually says, older sisters shall be nice to younger brothers. (laughs) Do you know where it says that, Emily? I wrote it in the blank page at the front. So it says it in my Bible. So what's gotten us to where we are? So before we ever get to what we're about to hear, here's what's happened. So David's the youngest. He's sort of the the runt of the family. He's out keeping the sheep because keeping sheep was like taking out the trash. And who likes to take out the trash? I never did. And as the youngest, guess what my job all the time was? Take out the trash. David's out keeping the sheep. Samuel, who's kind of like the prophet of the time, he comes by and he talks to David's father and he says, I need to find who the next leader of Israel will be, the next king of Israel. And so he wants to look at all of his sons as they march them in one by one by one. And Samuel says, is this all you got? And they said, yeah, we got the kid watching the sheep. How often do we as adults say, oh, it's a kid. And we diminish and dismiss the contributions of a youth because we say, oh, they're just a kid. So Samuel says, go get the kid. David comes in. Samuel looks at him and says, this is the one that God's been looking for. This is the guy. This is the one that's going to lead Israel. And he takes out a horn of oil, which is just basically like an old ram's horn with a cap in it. And he anoints David and says, you're going to be the next king of Israel. You're going to follow Saul. He said, in essence, in Hebrew, cue the man. I don't know about you, but I know with my older sisters, if I found out I was the king of Israel, I wasn't taking the trash out no more. And I wouldn't let him forget it. I got anointed. I got anointed. You ever done that to your brother? And you didn't. Mm -hmm. And guess what happens to David? David's father says, somebody's got to take care of the sheep. And David goes and he takes care of the sheep. That's where he is. In fact, the armies of Israel and the Philistines are battling the Philistines are these big guys, are the bad guys. The army of Israel is the good guys. And all of David's brothers are fighting, and there's this guy named Goliath the Philistine. You've heard the story of David and Goliath, right? Yeah. So David's actually going up, and what sometimes you miss in the text is it says he went to take some rations up, basically some food up to his brothers. And he's going up, and he's asking everybody, hey, what's going on? And all the Israelites are going, man, Israel's got like the Michael Jordan of the warlords. He, we, nobody can take him on the court. He's, we're afraid to face him. David says, yo. Well, it didn't actually say yo, but I think he did, right? He said, we're God's army. We're God's people. We can face this giant. I'll go take care of him. <laughs> yeah. He goes to somebody else. Twice he says, look, we're God's people. Giants don't bother us. We've got a God bigger than the giants. And then his brothers hear what he's doing. And they said, what'd you do coming up here? And they start ragging on him. You ever ragged on your little brother? I know exactly how it feels. And here's the best thing. You go look in 1 Samuel chapter 17. You're going to find this in the Bible. And David said, and I quote from the Holy Scriptures, what did I do now? Have you ever said that? What did I do now? And they finally said, okay, look. David, the runt, is here. He wants to fight Goliath. Fine. You want to fight Goliath? Well, we'll let you fight Goliath. And Saul, who is basically the person that David will follow after, says, all right, send in the runt. We've got to get him ready. Come on, Tyler. And this, then, is what the Scripture says. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 38. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. 
David strapped Saul's sword over the armor and tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in the shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, striking down the Philistine and killing him. There was no sword in David's hand. This is the word of God for people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Great job, Talon. And here, could you stand right here by me for a second? And uh, Cub, Andy, let's get a shot of these boots, because I think I'm going to wear them next week. <laughs> there are some pretty cool boots, girl. They shake all over when you go play? That's cool. Way to go. Do you think I can wear something like that? Uh, if I find them big enough. <laughs> yeah, I, I, knowing this congregation, I'd say if anybody can find those in 11 2 a, I'd wear them. I'm not doing that. I don't care what boots you bring me, I'm not wearing them. Let's pray together. God, in each of our lives, we remember that you call us by name. We're so thankful for the amazing faith of our youth that have reminded us this morning that no matter what our temptations are, you're always with us. No matter how big the storm is on the sea, you're the God that walks with us. So today, as they come to lead us, we give you thanks for who they are, who you've made them to be, and who they are becoming in Christ. In whose name we have gathered and pray and will go forth in your name to serve the world. And all of God's people did say, amen. I'm going to do a little bit of a survey for you guys. Because I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase before as youth, but sometimes we say, you know, don't get overwhelmed by all the stuff and homework and social pressures. I mean, these are the best years of your life. Do you remember saying that to somebody that's younger? These are the best years of your life. Here is the non-scientific poll that I'm about to take. And you can turn around and look and see. How many of you would be willing to go back to a period of raging hormones, acne, and social pressure and wondering who you're going to sit with at lunch? Raise your hand. Yeah. Nobody. We had two in the early service. Now, here's an even more scientific poll, because I know this one to be true. How many of you thank God that Facebook did not exist when you were in high school? I didn't even have to have a raise the hand. Look at that. Yeah. Now watch this. This is a really, really scientific poll. This, is, this may actually get them down here on their knees. How many of you are thankful to God that something you did in your teenage years, nobody but you and your best friend know about? There you go. Hands are going up before you. Yeah, some got both hands up. Yeah. So you are in a season of your life where you're growing. And you aren't the church of tomorrow. You're the church of today. You're the Davids of this world. You're the ones that we're calling forth. But don't underestimate the importance of what you're learning where you are. It doesn't mean you're going to have the answer to every single question. And it doesn't mean that just because you get anointed, you go right to kingship. We learn a lot in David's journey is how he grows. And the only way he faces the giant is to go as he is, right? So I've got a kind of an easy way, I think, to give this analysis. I was thinking of someone like J.J. Watt or something like that. But then I got to thinking, you know, maybe this would be a little better illustration. So I have a helper today who's going to come up and help me illustrate what this would be like. Let's say Pastor Bird is going to be gone for a Sunday, right? And so he needs someone to preach for him. And so what it does is he calls up and he says, we got anybody who can preach for me? And so he calls on Talon, the Tegan. Put your arm in there, other arm. There you go. Put your other arm over here. And he says, Tegan... Preach the word of God. Uh, oh! <laughs> Does it fit you? Well, why? Why did it fit you? Is it yours? No. Whose is it? It's mine, isn't it? It's too big for you, right? You want to take it home anyway and sleep in it? Yeah. You can't. <laughs> All right, head on back. Thank you. It won't fit. <laughs> yeah. And you got to remember, the older you get, the bigger your robes get. Yeah. Here's what's really cool. It's not in the scripture, but think of it this way. Tegan, there's places that you can go because of who you are that I can't go. 
There's places you'll fit that I never will. Right? So God's gifted you differently. And you're going to grow and you're going to learn what that's like. And you're going to grow in your faith. But don't underestimate how important it is because where did David go after he was anointed king? He went back to keeping the sheep. And to keep the sheep meant he would go to the valley of, uh, in his area and he would find a smooth stone. And he would use his shepherd's pouch. I like to think when I look at this text that what David learned keeping the sheep is what helped him as God was working his life and prepared him to face the giant. And if we read the whole text, what it says is that David knelt in the brook at the Valley of Elah. I will be there in two weeks. I'm going to be at the brook of the Valley of Elah, and I'm going to find a stone, and I'm going to put it. I, I can't take enough stones for everybody. They won't let me back into the country. But I'm going to get a stone, and I'm going to put it on my little curio cabinet, and you can come by and see what the stone looks like. It'll be round and smooth. But he didn't pick just one. He picked five. He went prepared. But he went as he was. The world around you wants to put you in someone else's clothes. The world around you is going to tell you your only value is what you weigh, how you look, what your grades are, if you're hip, if you're in, if you know the right music, or if you have the right friends. That's all the world trying to tell you you're only going to face the giants and challenges if you look like this or you act like this. In a lot of ways, Austin Skitt speaks exactly to the temptation we have. We're drawn to be somebody that we're not. Be who God created you to be and gifted you to be. And giants will come and giants will fall. But what you're going to learn as you grow in the faith is that God will teach you what you need to know in the season of keeping the sheep. When you're where you don't think you deserve to be or where you should be or where you ought to be or where you want to be, do what God has given you to do now. Grow in your faith, and that will prepare you later on when you face giants. I want to tell you how proud I am of our youth ministry and children's ministry here at Polk Street that help children and youth grow. But I also want to tell you something that kind of has been a burden on my heart, and this is probably going to make Mike Jones faint and have a heart attack, so someone can call 911 if they need to, um, but make sure, if he goes all the way over, just check his pulse before you call, okay? I want to be real honest with you about where we are as a church. And that honesty has to do with the fact that in previous years, we had people who would step forward and make major contributions for a singular purpose of providing scholarships and funding for our children and our youth to go to camp. Our children's and youth camp now cost about $350 to $400 to participate. If we want our youth and children to not have obstacles, we're going to have to find a way as a church to make helping our youth and our children get to camp a higher priority than it is. That's just the reality. And so as you look at this season's year in, yes, we need money for the budget to finish the year. Yes, we need to be faithful to your Nehemiah project. Yes, we need contributions for the snack pack program for kids. And yes, we need some folks who are willing to make contributions to the scholarship fund so that when our kids say, I want to go to camp, it doesn't cost $350 per child from each family. And if you happen to have two children, that's $700. And if you have to want to send them on a mission trip, that costs $500. I mean, if you want to send two kids to the mission trip, one to a mission, two to a mission trip, and two to camp, it's going to be $1,700. That's the cost. And I don't fault the folks for who charge that, but we need to find a way as a church to equip our families because the reality is every one of us is here because someone did this for us when we were growing. So as you look at your year in and you're looking at things like, oh, that little Russell Stover's chocolates that's only going to make your doctor upset because your A1C and, and your blood sugar went up, or you're looking at that scented candle that's going to melt halfway while you ship it, or Maybe the sausage that has so much processed stuff in it that you, you're going to throw it away anyway. You don't want to eat it. Or the, or the cheese that you unwrap in plastic and you take one bite and you go, Ugh! and then you politely say, oh, thank you so much. I want to challenge you something really radical this year. What if we just, all as a church, in our giving, at the adult level, I'm not saying don't get anything for your kids, okay? Don't pull this on the kids, all right? Barker off, don't pull this on your kids, Okay. 
I don't want to be the nemesis of the Barcroft home. What I'm talking about is an adult giving in your Sunday school class, in your gift giving to each other. What if it looked like if we made snack pack, the church ministries close in the year, the children's and youth funding their scholarships? What if we made that a priority? I can tell you that Sean and I have already decided to do that at our home. We were having dinner the other day and said, you know, we, we don't lack or need anything. No, we're not going to, you know, don't give me the cologne that I'm going to say, oh, that's so sweet. That still is underneath the bathroom counter and hasn't been used. Or let's just, let's find a way to make a difference in the world. That's what I want to ask and put on your heart. And yeah, I'm asking you today because you've seen it. And two weeks ago, you saw the children. And last week, you saw the children. If we're going to make a difference in this world, it's going to be because we invest and choose to invest in our children and in our youth. So I want you to think about that. And not just now go, amen, preacher, somebody else ought to do that. I want you to take it to heart and pray about it in your own life and journey. And to all you youth who sometimes are just sort of a bundle of walking hormones and stuff, we love you. We're so proud of you. We're so thankful you're a part of our worship. It's so much fun when you hide the donuts from me and don't let me have any. (laughs) And we want you to know who you are is defined by God, not by the world around you. And Jesus said everything about how much he loves you on the cross. He loves you to life, and he literally loved you to death. Let's pray together. God, be with our youth as they continue to grow in their faith. Be with all the ministries of our church as we seek to make a difference in the lives of individuals, to transform the world around us, to be a place that people can encounter your grace and your love. And help each of us to recognize we can only be who you've created us to be and go as we are. So help us to learn what you are teaching us in this season of our life so that each of us may face the giants that are yet to be in our path. For it is in the name of Christ that we pray. And all of God's people did say, Amen.